for you. Uh, all right, welcome everyone. This is 1619 Project discussion hosted by the Pasadena Village and our speaker today is Brian Beery who has been a regular speaker here. Today he's gonna to be talking about education, the state of education in the country today and how it's changed over the last 30 years. So it's a very important uh, topic for the current times. Education is very important to democracy and we all know where we stand with that. So um, Brian, it's all yours, take it away please. Thanks, Dick. Um, a couple of quick points. One is, is that this is what I would say an ongoing process in the sense that um, the research that I've conducted, but then also the, it's a fluid scenario. Um, and so while what we're gonna talk about a little bit today occurred 50 years ago, 60 years ago, um, there's still reverberations about some of these artifacts or these historical um, uh, realities, and um, it's continuing to uh, shift and change. The, the other comment I wanted to make is that we probably won't use the entire 90 minutes um, because uh, my research in this area is um, underway, and, but it's not complete. And so there's a lot that I still am learning. Uh, so what I'm planning on doing is providing you with an introduction today and then have a discussion. Well, we'll, we'll be interactive. It'll be interactive. We'll be talking as we go. There'll be a brief review of some of the concepts that we, we talked about in previous um, presentations, but then uh, we'll talk specifically about education and public education in Pasadena from a historical viewpoint. And something else I would say or remark is that I think that a lot of our experiences here in Pasadena um, I wouldn't say replicate, but they resonate with other uh, cities around the country. So if we're talking about Boston, if we're talking about Chicago, we're talking about um, segregation uh, throughout the country and the South and other Northern cities. Um, it's very similar what's happened here as what's happened in these other places. And there's, um, there's a lot of, disturbing information about our our past which one i want everyone to be thinking about how does it affect our present and then what are the uh potential influences for the future and then i'm i'm glad that um katie's here too is one of the big questions i want to ask all of you is uh, as individuals, what, how are you connected to public education right now? Um, what, in what ways are you um, not only aware of what's going on, but are you uh, active in public education as individuals? And then also from the Pasadena Village perspective, what's the relationship between the Pasadena Village and the Pasadena Unified School District? What's the relationship um, between the Pasadena Village and um, families that are served by the Pasadena Unified School District? And then also what's the relationship between the Pasadena Village and nonprofit uh, organizations? And, and I can talk about a, literally dozens of them that are serving the, the POSD in a wide variety of ways. And, and it's not, it's all it is is to be thinking about if, if there is a need in the community, how how do organizations like the Pasadena Village uh, fill those needs, um, or what in what ways can, especially when you're thinking about the village and all of the experience that you all have and the knowledge and the wisdom, uh, what are ways in which that could be potentially shared with? Um, students uh, who are currently enrolled in the POSD. So those are just some opening thoughts. Um, I think you got, I think you got way more than a 90 minute discussion right there, Brian. Don't need to worry about that. <laughs> well, if, if we end early, I will cede my time back to the chair. 
Um, the, so, so let me go through uh, just a couple of uh, um, kind of a grounding of what we've talked about before, just because some of you might not have been on some of our other calls. I know that Will has, I know Sharon has, um, I think Katie has too, but um, just a couple of historical um, key facts. And then I want to hear from you all. I have a couple of questions for you. So we'll, well, I'm going to share the screen for a, a couple of minutes and then, um, then we'll jump back into the uh, conversation. So um, thanks to Dick, as always, for enabling me to um, communicate with you all. Um, we want to talk about uh, the, kind of the causes. What is, what is segregation, first of all? Um, what causes it? Uh, how is it manifested in Pasadena? And then what were the, the causes and then efforts to desegregate uh, the Pasadena Unified School District. So welcome to everyone and thank you for being here. And I'm looking forward to having a robust conversation with you. Um, just a little bit, you know, we're, we're talking about um, historically segregation in education. And so thinking about Pasadena as a, a place where um, the issue of racism and the issue of oppression uh, is very prominent, even though a lot of people don't talk about it very much, certainly not publicly. And then to be thinking about who in over the years has attempted to address the issue and and um, some of the ways in which that's been uh, adjusted. So the, um, and just a, a footnote or just a note is that uh, friendship Baptist Church was started in 1893, and the First AME Church was started in 1887 in Pasadena. So there's a long, long history of African American churches in the city, and um, in involved in um, Pasadena politics. Uh, the um, NAACP Pasadena branch was founded in 1919. Uh, so then the undergirding, of course, is what Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said here in Pasadena. And it's, it's thinking about, you know, these days the concepts are talked about a diversity, equity, inclusion, and then ac access or accessibility. And um, historically, it's been about freedom. It's been about liberation. It's, uh, I think it's moved to another level of consciousness. So a lot of this is to be thinking about how, how do we ensure that everyone in the community is seen as valued? How do we ensure that everyone in the community has a, a role or a place um, and has access to everything from this topic, education to housing, to employment, to healthcare, to a political voice? And then what is our role to make sure that that happens? Uh, so these are some concepts that I've talked about before, but just that, uh, as I mentioned before, Pasadena is often assumed to be very inclusive and very um, uh, liberal and very progressive. But um, one, uh, that always, hasn't always been the case. And two, there are certainly factions within any community that are more conservative. And so we just want to call those out um, and um, understand why they exist and then um, how to be in dialogue with people of differences of opinion. And, and I'll just reinforce too that I've always felt that because of Pasadena's um, diversity and its multiple layers of uh, society that are represented here, we have everything from uh, significant numbers of people who are unhoused and significant numbers of people who are uh, immigrant families uh, to significant numbers of people who are 
low income or working class to the extremely wealthy and the extremely rich. Uh, if you ever want to do something fun, just go on Zillow or Redfin and see um, what houses are going for in Linda Vista Annandale and San Rafael and um, around the Langham. And uh, probably no one on this call can afford those, but it's pretty amazing to see 10, 15, $20 million homes uh, are littered around Pasadena. So we have this dichotomy of extreme wealth and yet uh, vast numbers of people who are uh, struggling each day to get by. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of a historical overview and uh, talk about some of the research and then talk specifically about segregation and what it uh, what it's caused uh, or what the causes of it and then um, what some of the response was here for the Pasadena Unified School District and then um, take a couple minutes to talk about where we are to get today. Uh, so this is, I'm gonna take the screen share off and I'm gonna, I wanna ask you two couple of questions. What's the role of uh, public education in a democratic society and then what would our society look like if there were uh, less than half of the, the population was educated outside the public school system. So uh, let's talk about that and let's focus in on mainly what, from your perspective, what's the role of public education, um, both historically and today? So any um, volunteers, any takers who want to venture a thought why 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 do we have public schools i'll pitch in the answer to that is that uh, democracy depends on an educated populace and the idea is that education should be available to everyone in the country and uh, have an opportunity to learn and understand what the country is all about. And we cannot have an effective democracy if we have an uneducated population. So that's so how, how would that's that's great. Thank you, uh, Dick, for starting us off. What what does educated mean and who defines how people are educated and what what level of education? You thought you were just going to come and listen to a lecture today, right? <laughs> no. Well, you're it's... talking about basic reading and writing and arithmetic, but you're also talking about understanding something about how our society works. And our current education system appears to be, I'm not an expert by any means, but I read in the papers and read the press, and it sounds like that our current education system does not teach people anything about civics or how our society works, mm -hmm. and it should do that. So that's a very simplistic statement of, of a starting point for defining what edu education means. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it means a lot more than that, but that's a basic start. Right. Yeah, not, it's the, it's the yeah, basis for voting uh, would be reading and knowledge of civics. So, Betsy, talk a little bit more about that. What what is our what is voting? Why is voting important and what how do you prepare to vote? Well, I'm, th I'm thinking of the League of Women Voters and the kind of pros and cons presentations and uh, understanding what the issues are that drive governmental decision making. Yeah, understanding the issues and imagine, I mean, we were all, it's maybe it's longer in the past for some of us, but we were all 18 at one time, right? So um, what was it like your first time voting? What did you need to know? What, what were you concerned about? What were you anxious about? Oh. Yes, Sharon? It was only, I remember vividly, first time I voted. Um, I voted absentee. And um, I was in college at the time in San Diego, but my actual residence was in Orange County. And I had only one concern, and that was the Vietnam War. Mm. That was it. Mm -hmm. Everyone I voted for, that was the research that I did. Was, what was what was their thing about that? So both Dick and Betsy have mentioned knowledge. Um, how 
how would one become knowledgeable about Vietnam and the war there, especially at that time? At the time, I um, did a lot of I did a lot of reading across um, my in my parent in, well, in my father's home. You had two uh, journals, both national, National Geographic and National Review. So you had, that's where I started was National Review. Then I would bring in the nation. And so it was really um, reading across a lot of different writers trying to get um, some sense of what my own thinking was and the newspapers and talking. Yeah, and the, the whole point there, and thank you for describing that, Sharon, is first of all, is that you know where to go for information. Secondly, you know you're capable enough to be able to read uh, the information. Thirdly, you're able to um, digest it, assess it, um, and then come to some, through critical thinking or analysis, and then fourth, to be able to come to some conclusions about your own feelings on that particular issue. Obviously, the Vietnam War is extraordinarily fraught with uh, emotion and um, uh, everything from psychological and emotional and uh, physical um, pain and suffering. Uh, but it, it takes an educated, you know, if we go back to Dick's term, it takes an educated person to be able to um, understand what's happening, why it's happening, how it affects me, and then how I, I take action. So one of the actions that you take is voting, right? right. But And there are many other actions. And of course, during the Vietnam War, there, there were multiple actions, uh, protests and, and um, nonviolent, uh, peaceful um, marches, things like that. But if we don't have an education system, how how do people then participate right how do you how do you gain enough knowledge or information to be able to make a determination about how you feel about anything let alone war uh, but how you feel about um you know how cities are built or developed or how um, water is used or how the climate is changing or transportation systems or housing or poverty. So um, going back to the, the other question is, uh, you know, what would our society look like? So imagine if, okay, let me, let's back into it a different way. When you were, so think about all the towns you grew up in or the cities you grew up in. What would you say the percentage was of, um, of young people, of families that sent their kids to public school? Any guesses or, or any recollections? What would you say? And where, where, where did some of you grow up? So Sharon, you grew up in Los Angeles. What was the, what do you think that in the 60s, 50s, 60s, what was the percentage of public school to private school? I, I don't have a guess. The only public school as an elementary student that I attended was for kindergarten. And then my family put me into the not for kindergarten. Okay, so eight, I was in the Catholic school. Well, I went to the So I don't really know in the neighborhood I grew up in what percentage of the young folk went to public. I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, and my guess would be that probably 70 percent, but that would include uh, the Catholic schools as well. And if you take them out, then the percentage of public schools might drop to like 55 percent, 70 percent in broad school based systems and, and maybe as many as 20 percent or so going to what I would have called private schools. Yeah. So 70, 80 percent in public and uh 20% in private. What about the rest of you? What were your experiences? Thanks, Dick. My, this is my experience, Will. Uh, 
I went to private schools most of my elementary career until I came to pass. I was in Vermont and I went to sixth grade in a two room public school house there. And then we moved to Sierra Madre with the Pasadena school systems. And when I went to Pasadena's junior high school, which was on the same campus as Pasadena High School, I freaked because in my little town with one school had one school bus. And when I came out to get bus home from Sierra Madre to Sierra Madre, there were rows and rows of school buses. I had no idea which one I should take. It was big and overwhelming, so I wound up going to a Episcopal parochial school until I went to high school, which was a private school. And I did not really effectively get into the public school system until I moved back to Pasadena at college, went to Pasadena City College and transferred to UC Berkeley. So my ex personal experience of public education is it was a inferior substitute for good education that you got in private schools. Hmm. So um, maybe a follow up question for everyone to think about is uh, is private education um, accessible to everyone? Or what What would society look like if um, our main driver of education was private school education? What would the impacts be? There'd be less education. Why? Because private school education is for wealthier people. It, only the only the only only the church schools would be uh would provide education for lower income people could well, that's well, not actually potentially the case there's a move to have vouchers where people would be given the equivalent of the money that would be spent on public schools which could then go to private schools church schools other types of schools different sorts of charter schools so you don't have to have an income barrier to private education the way it is currently of course that's a potential not that's a potential not a reality one of the results would be everybody in their own silo uh, so you'd have you know the catholics here and the presbyterians mm -hmm. here and everybody would be with their own little group and not mm -hmm. not diverse that that is so true um in in going to Catholic school, um, th we were all the same. I mean, e even if we had kind of diverse backgrounds, and you know, in terms of our parents, it, we had something very big in common, <laughs> and um, we didn't stray too far from from that commonality. And then when I went to public school, um, that was the first thing I noticed was the, the, the diversity of approaches to things and ways of thinking and ways of organizing self and so on. Um, because not everybody had had, as you say, that silo that they grew up in. That was Baltimore Catechism and all that good stuff. Oh, so, yeah, very different. So, so was, that would be my experience. Yeah, so I want, um... And this is a thought exercise. It's something I'm sure you talk with your families about on a regular basis, or maybe, maybe friends. But just be thinking about what what does society look like if it is privatized? Um, if education is privatized, um, we'll mention this notion of vouchers. Sure, um, that that is an option. I think I think a lot of people need to. Well, I think society needs to talk a little bit more deeply about what the the variables would be as if every imagine if everybody in the United States was given a voucher and then what what would that look like as far as education? You know, where would you go and how are you um, choosing which school, those sorts of things? Let, let's talk for a second about what uh, life is like right now in Pasadena. Again, you probably have children and grandchildren who are um, thinking about these issues. So a uh, quick story is my, my mother, who some of you might know, um, she's a part-time villager. Um, 
on the street where she lives, where I grew up, when I was when I was living there, everyone pretty much everyone on our block went to the uh, public school around the corner. So it was it's Hamilton School. It's over in East Pasadena. Um, I had a neighbor who lived a couple blocks away, you know, and sharing your point about Catholic school, there was a there's a guy named John and John and his family, they were Catholic. And so they went to St. Philip. St. Philip's is on the hill right by um, PCC. Um, but everyone else, uh, and, and by the time uh, junior high or middle school, however you call it, came around, John ended up joining us at um, McKinley and then at Blair. So um I think anecdotally, but also statistically, uh, what Dick was saying about percentages, it's most cities around the country are 80 percent public, 90, even 90 percent public and 10, 20 percent private. Um, it's not that way anymore. So when I go visit my mom, it's always interesting uh, because I'll drive down the street. And these days there are a lot of yard signs for schools. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen those yard signs. Mm -hmm. uh, so a yard sign might be a Marshall school or it might be a St. Andrews or it might be a St. Mark's or whatever. What I can tell you is now on, and there are a lot of kids on my mom's block, which is kind of nice because for a long time it was, um, all the kids said, all the families had moved away. And now there are plenty of children. They all go to different schools. Um, where my neighbors and I would go walk together to go to Hamilton, it doesn't happen, at least not in that neighborhood. And I'm sure in a lot of neighborhoods in Pasadena, it doesn't happen that way anymore. So that um, collegiality or that convi conviviality, or, or, you know, I think maybe it was Betsy or was talking about there's this community feel when you, when you and your neighbors all go to the same school, there are bonds, there are relationships, there are ties that are formed. Um, so what happens is my, my neighbors or my mother's neighbors, they have their friend circles are not with their neighbors, but their friends circles are with their schools. And so they're, they spend their time driving over to wherever that school is halfway across town instead of being at the neighborhood school. So I just use that uh, story to illustrate a couple of points. One is um neighborhood schools are uh, uh a phenomenon of the past certainly in pasadena i i had this conversation uh, uh, another quick story i had this conversation that we're having right now uh about two months ago with fuller theological seminary uh students D does everyone familiar with fuller anybody not know what fuller is um so okay everyone knows what fuller is so um Real fuller is uh, what will? <laughs> will will Fuller, Fuller, Will Fuller, yeah, Will Fuller accommodate. Oh yeah, that's, 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 that's Will School. Sorry, I forgot all about that. Um, <laughs> thanks for uh, bringing up the levity there. Anyway, um, I was assuming that these were students from Los Angeles, and and by the way, when I say students, these are all adults, and they're all already uh, pastors, reverends. Um, they're all ministers already in their own churches. They're they're working on their, uh, I guess it's the, um, the master. It's not the master, but Masters. it's like the the professor of uh, divinity degree. Um, so they're all working on their PhDs in um, religion. It's a doctor of divinity, if you want. Yeah. Yeah, and so, the, but they were from they were from all over the country. So they were from Indianapolis, they were from Austin, they were from Albuquerque, they were from Chicago. So I asked them that same question is, in your towns, what are you seeing as far as changes? And um, they said it's it's similar in our cities too, where uh, people on the same block, families on the same block will not go to the same school. They'll all be going to different schools. And it's in part, I mean, Will talked about vouchers. That's one of the reasons. And they'll and so it's harder too for churches to create um, church communities at least that are geographical. They they can certainly create their community within the context of their church, but they're having people come from different places, and they aren't necessarily 
forming um, relationships. So another example is when I went to Hamilton School, we had a Cub Scout troop. So my mom was the Cub Scout leader and the Cub Scouts were all from that neighborhood. Now Cub Scouts are coming from Altadena and Sierra Madre and San Bernardino and Pasadena. So it just creates a different uh, milieu to work in. So what we're doing today is just asking a question, not is it good or bad, and not um, is one system better or worse, but what are the implications? And in a broader sense, and I'm glad Dick brought this up as far as education, in a broader sense, what are the implications for a democratic society, for decision-making, for astute populace, um, for um, connections uh, relationally, um, for um, civic engagement, and, and that's everywhere from just voting to actually becoming a, um, uh, a candidate possibly for school board or city council or um, the uh, LA board of supervisors, county board of supervisors, whatever it is. So um, as, as I talk, I'm gonna go back to the presentation now. And as I, I talk, I want you to be thinking about these questions and, and how is it that our society is shifting? Before I do that, I'd like to go to Dick because he has a question. Yeah, I have a comment there. My wife and I both went to public schools through high school. My two sons in Houston, Texas went to public schools, but they went to magnet schools. Mm -hmm. And the magnet schools were an entirely different thing. We lived in a segregated neighborhood, but the schools they went to were integrated because they were drawing from all over the city. And they drew some of the kids, some of the schools were academic oriented, but Others were different kinds of things. For example, they both went to the high school for the performing and visual arts. So all of the kids there had some kind of artist, artistic focus. They were in theater. They were in dance. They were in orchestra. They were in jazz. They were in uh, visual arts. But they all had some kind of artistic uh, ability that brought them together. But what it meant was a much more diverse population. And of course, it also meant that their friends that they had were scattered from all over the city rather than be in neighborhoods. They didn't have neighborhood friends. So they didn't know friends from the neighborhoods. And I think that that gives you an indication of what private school voucher systems would be like because because that's in effect a voucher system was the magnet school system that they had in Houston at the time. And I think they still operate on that basis. So that gives, that illustrates, I think a little bit about the impact that vouchers might have on uh, education because people were, the kids were going to different schools based on their interest and talent, but they were coming from a much more diverse population than my neighborhood was. So, uh, Will, I'll come to you real quick, just of uh, some slight responses or brief responses okay. to Dick. Well, well here, here, here's the reason. The response is, is not just brief. I'm not sure when you talk about going to different schools, whether you're talking about going to different public schools or different types of school, because that's qualitatively very different in terms of thing, because we have public education in Portland, where I live, Portland, Oregon, is still 80, 90% public. Kids mostly not go to public schools, but they have begun losing faith in the quality of the schools and are more going to private, but it's by no means a majority because there's a high barrier for economics. There's no, there's no low cost private schools. So what, when you say different schools, they're not neighborhood schools, but they're they different besides public schools? They is there a majority they were, going not they were to go into public, public schools? They were public schools, but one of the criticisms of those programs was it took talented kids out of neighborhood schools and concentrated them in the magnet school system. So there was some feeling among the people who were going to neighborhood schools that they were being deprived of the more talented kids. And so it had an impact both on the kids who went to the magnet schools as well as on the kids who were left behind. Yes, yeah, so that's a similar system in Portland, same criticism. Yes, um, but they were all back, public back, schools. They were all public yeah. schools provided by the public, but they had the magnet okay. school system. So public education, because I want to, one other brief comment on the purpose of public education, because I think what we want to have is basically what people have said, a place where people are given the power to maintain a representative democratic government. I would suggest that public education, as it has been practiced, is a system to produce 
patriotic, obedient people with job skills, but not the skills to be effective in controlling government. Oh, that's a heavy one. <laughs> well, but but that is the Horace Mann model. The public school is there to create the workers. For exactly workers, not citizens. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the Horace so, Mann model. Yeah, great, great discussion. Uh, really appreciate all your observations. And uh, again. The reason why we're here today or the reason why I'm here is to ask these questions and to ask so then if if this is how it's set up and how and uh, what Dick was talking about and will too is that there's been an evolution where so let's say for example and I won't talk about any of your experiences but my mother and father uh, my f mother went to Pasadena High School and my father went to Muir High School so there was no such thing as a magnet school there was no such thing as um, a uh, a charter school. Uh, there were no such thing as as vouchers. So we can see that there's been a, a dramatic transformation in our school system, and those are examples of it. And we can also see uh, some of the reasons why there has been that transformation. I think several of you verbally stated. Um, lack of faith in public school system, lack of um, uh, um, confidence that it is educating in the ways that we need it to educate, lack uh, or a um, or the the dedication of public schools to being places of just creating workers as opposed to citizens. So all of these um, questions have come up over the last 50, 60 years and have altered the course of public education and have also altered parents' choices about where they send their children. So, what I, because when I, I think one of the deepest seated um, desires for parents, and many of you are parents, is you want the best for your kids, right? And you want them to do better than you did, or at least as well as you did. So it starts at a very early age of this parent, and certainly it's exacerbated, I think, by a lot of everything from social media and websites, but it's exacerbated by the fact that at an early age, you're trying to figure out how do I get my kid on the right path so that they're successful, so that then they have a good life. And we equate high quality education with good life and high quality education with good jobs. Um, and so we're all scrambling to figure out how, how to control or how to make sure that our kids go from the best and highest performing preschool to the best. I, I talk about this all the time with my friend. I have two close family friends and one of them emailed me last week and said, oh, um, what do you think about Blair? And then, you know, earlier on, it was like, how do we get, how do we get into Marshall? Or, you know, how do we, how do we make sure, you know, we, we have this great experience at Hamilton. Now, what do we do for middle school? You know, it's this, because there's this, I think, and Katie, I know you're thinking about these things too, but it's like, if we don't do this right as parents, our kids' lives are going to suffer because of it. If they don't get into the right school, then they may not get into the right college. They may not get into then the right career. So we put, we have so much riding on this, these decisions that we're constantly worried about where, um, how schools are structured, what the curriculum is, who is teaching our kids? Um, and then how is it a magnet school? Is it gonna provide all these other you know, special activities or is it gonna be something that's um, more traditional? So uh, just as a, a framework, there's a place called CS Arts. Have any of you heard of that? CS Arts. CS Arts. So to Dick's point, it's a magnet school, it's in Dewarty. 
Um, I live in Pasadena and I live pretty close to the village headquarters there on Lincoln and um, or near Link uh, on a mountain near Lincoln and Mountain. Um, my neighbors uh, have two high school students. They don't send them to Blair, Muir, PHS or Marshall. They send them to CS Arts. And to Dick, your point, it's a mag it's an arts magnet school. So why why would why would my neighbors who could easily get to Muir pretty quickly or Blair, um, why would they drive all the way to Duarte every day? Better quality education is what they're looking for. How do you measure better quality education? And um, Katie, I know you're, uh, you like to stay neutral in all these conversations, but this is kind <laughs> of something that, that you have real life experience with. So I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Well, um, so I have, I have two kids. They're 11 and 13. And um well, I, two of the things I was thinking about when you were saying better quality education, I don't think that's all of it. Um, one of the main reasons we didn't send our daughter to Pasadena Public Schools, we toured six of them, was the safety. We didn't feel like she'd be safe as a five-year-old on the campus. And um, when you go into a classroom with 31 four-year-olds with scissors and one adult, that's just not the amount of attention you want your child to have or safety or bathroom breaks or anything. I think the resources that are available in the passing of public schools are just not adequate. And I, I do try to stay neutral, but I feel very strongly that that the kids are not getting enough attention because they're under-resourced. The schools are under-resourced. There's not enough adults per kid there's not enough there to let, allow them to have um a positive experience where they can have the opportunity to learn um and that's my personal opinion and that's what i've seen um my kids were in the passing public schools for one year um in second and fourth second and fifth grade um but I just feel like that there's got to be some major change um, to make sure our kids are positioned so that they can then learn quality education. Thank you very much, Katie. Thanks for talking about that. We'll hang on just a sec because um, I want to pose a question to everybody. What would it take for society to um, provide quality education for all of its uh, children. So just be thinking about that. Um, Will, go ahead. Well, that issue of resources is very much part of it. What are good resources for there? Uh, I wanted to say to Katie, uh, I, as I, you heard, I didn't go to Pasadena Public Schools, but my younger brother and sister did. And they were this, we're talking the 60s here. And they went to a public, I forget which one, it was on the west side of Muir or something like that. Anyhow, my parents pulled them out because they were consistently being harassed for their lunch money, being bullied, being beat up, and the safety simply wasn't there way back then. So it's been a chronic issue in, in education, in public education for a long time. Resources are where you have enough staff and a system of discipline and expectations of discipline that you don't have that fear in going to a public school. It's like the public, when I was in North Carolina, so I started my education, public school was where you went if you couldn't afford to go anywhere else, period. And they were markedly inferior in every respect. It was, safety was not great, but the quality of education sucked. And we have, we have an issue, if this is still coming up today, uh, it's money, it's teacher training, it's a commitment by the public to fund that sort of thing effectively and to demand good quality education, I think, for resources. And if that's not there, we are de facto running a segregated system based at least on wealth 
and I would expect part of it because of the economic disadvantages of people of color, that becomes a racial disparity. And it is a, for me, a national tragedy that our public systems are so far from living up to what they should be, and we expect them to be. So I, I, do, I, do, I do think if I could just say real quick, because I'm gonna go yeah, off sure. camera. Um, I think that when that's when the parent involvement makes such a difference and community involvement volunteers in the classroom and it can make a huge difference. It, I mean, if, if there was student, if there were volunteers in the classroom, when I toured it, my kids might be in a totally different place. Like, um, um, but without parent involvement, which might be socioeconomic might be, um, other reasons because they're working, we're working parents, um, but you know the schools that are seeing more parent involvement, I think will have better student outcomes and literally people in the classroom parent involvement as well as the PTAs and the volunteering outside of school. Yeah, great, great point, Katie. Thank you for adding that, um, Dick. Yeah, I'll throw in one, a couple of other things. My experience with education goes back a little earlier than a lot of other people in this group. But uh, when I went to school, schools were, and when and where I went to school, schools were funded by real estate taxes. And that meant that schools in, in higher priced neighborhoods had more resources. But there's another, <laughs> there's another change in education. When I, went to, when I went to school, educated, intelligent women became teachers. They didn't become doctors and lawyers. Okay, and that that has made a big change in public education, too, because you had a different core of people who were the teachers. And uh, that was a much, you know, you had a focus group there of women with talent and had nowhere else to go except to become teachers or secretaries. And that, that I think, has has created quite a bit change in, in public education, too. But it comes back to resources. Okay, so as society changes, a lot of things change. Yeah, and again, uh, the reason for raising these questions is what are the implications for society as as this? And again, uh, they, these are national issues. Obviously, they're manifested uh, immensely, enormously in Pasadena. But what are the implications for society overall? And just be thinking about how do other um, civilizations and societies um, manage education, uh, you know, other countries, how is it going in Hong Kong or Finland or Canada or Australia and, and how are they dealing with these uh, modern issues as well? Dick. Yeah, I want to tie this in since this is the 1619 group. I want to tie this into the whole 1619 concept, too, because I think it underlies a lot of the allocation of resources. Six, 1619, I, I, this, my phone is on Do Not Disturb, but she's apparently figured out how to get around it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think that the, the whole, the whole uh, 1619 background has created a sense in this society that there are certain people that don't deserve access to the same resources as other people. And I think that that whole concept underlies a lot of the different resources that are available in different places. And I think that has an, an underlying effect on all of the discussion we're having about allocation of resources and whether we put resources into public education. So I think there's a I think there's a direct 1619 tie in to this discussion as well. Well, the Dick, the, thank you for bringing that up. That's the reason why we're talking about this. This is a this is a, de depending on your point of view, of course. I think we'll define it pretty well too. But it's a it's a social justice issue. It's a racial justice issue. It's an equity issue. It is a, a race issue. Um, it's a discrimination issue. It's and uh, one of the comments I heard just a few minutes ago was the only people who stayed in the public school were the people who had no other options. Yes. So what does society look like in the future if those are the families, the only families in public education and anyone and everyone who has an option, who has a possibility of looking for some, like, like my neighbors, you know, going to Duarte, um, they walk. What, what happens when 
when everybody walks who can walk. Uh, and then the people who can't walk are left behind. So again, it's just, um, I wanna raise these questions not, <laughs> and um, there's this philosopher who I, uh, I, I'm always irritated by, but um, I'm going to channel right now. It's like, I have no answers. I only have questions is what the, my philosopher friend always tells me. Um, so that's that's what I'm doing right now is asking these difficult, complicated, uh, emotional questions. And I think Katie's comments are emblematic of how hard it is to figure out what to do um, as a parent and as families and then as society and going to Will's point about allocation of funds, how do we ensure that politically we're allocating the funds needed to be able to um, provide quality education or a level of education that's acceptable to everyone and the safety that Katie's talking about. So let's go through a few, um, uh, I guess I would say historical facts and, or just concepts and um, and then we'll come back and uh, talk again. So I'm gonna share my screen for a couple of minutes and um, walk you through. And again, uh, as I mentioned, the research is so time consuming. There's so much information out there. And this is just a snapshot of what I've learned. I really want to become even more knowledgeable about this subject so that I can help people to talk about public education in informed ways and ways in which we can find some um, uh, pathways, maybe not total solutions, but at least pathways for action. So I'm gonna share the screen again and we'll um, dive into a little bit of our, uh, the concepts that we were talking about. And I'm going to play around with my All right. Oop. I hit the wrong button. Okay. Here we go. Uh so we're going to we're going to review a little bit of Pasadena's early history and I'm going to relate it uh more to the education piece and um so I want you to be thinking about uh what's happened in the past. Uh, so uh, to Dick's point directly of the 1619 project and then also of discrimination, um, there in Pasadena's history, there have been um, uh, movements of, well, I mean, even my family uh, came to Pasadena in 1921. So there, there's a constant stream of um, people moving from other places. So those people included Chinese and they came in the 1880s. Uh, 18, maybe late 1870s, more of the 1880s, 1890s, and they came to um, be farm workers. So they were uh, picking the, the oranges and the lemons that are a part of, um, you know, this whole region's history. Um, immediately, they found pushback. And as you can see in the sign, which I've shown before to all of you, that they weren't allowed in the packing house. They weren't allowed in downtown Pasadena. Um, but they were kept segregated in uh, their own little community, uh, kind of like a small Chinatown. Um, this also talks about African-Americans came to uh, Los Angeles and then Pasadena. And uh, there was a lot of movement in the 1890s, 1890s and then 1910, 19 teens. There was another round um, after World War II of, of folks who came to the West Coast. And then uh, there was another round in a little bit later in the 60s and 70s. Um, there's also uh, constant immigration from Latin America, in particular Mexico. And there's a constant stream. Approximately 30% uh, of Palestinian's population today is uh, Latino or Hispanic, uh, however you want to define that. And a significant portion of, of that group is um, monolingual Spanish or their um, original or native language is Spanish. Uh, so it's a significant number. And that translates, the reason why that's important is it translates into the 
the population of the school district. So it's over 50% um, Latino right now. Um, what, again, what all of these um, uh, cultural and ethnic groups found is that there was pushback by uh, white people lived here that people of color uh, had a very difficult time living in um, California, even though it wasn't as blatant as Mississippi. Uh, one of the quotes that I always find fascinating, there's a woman named Ruby McKnight Williams, who is a, a member of the local NACP chapter. Uh, and she said, um, and it, uh, her quote is, I didn't see any difference between Pasadena and Mississippi, except that they were spelled differently. And she's talking about the racial uh, overtones or undertones that um, were that existed here. And I, I wasn't even going to talk about this, but um, how many of you are familiar with Jackie Robinson? Anybody know who Jackie Robinson was? Okay, yeah, pretty much everybody. Um, so he uh, said, once he was hired by the Dodgers, he said, um, essentially, I'm never going back to Pasadena. And he didn't. And the reason was that he was treated so poorly as an African-American male in Pasadena that he never wanted to live here. And he only, uh, my understanding is he only came back a couple times to visit family, but he ended up moving to the East Coast and living in Connecticut. Uh, this is another um, uh, research document that I wanted to share with you, which we've seen before. I'm not gonna go into the whole study, but this is a, a moment in time in the 30s and 40s when there's a lot of um, upheaval and it influences then what happens later on in the 60s and 70s. So James Crimey um, was a student at USC and this is his master's thesis paper and it's the social status of the Negro in Pasadena. And what I always tell groups too is that it says um, you know Negro or African-American and that's his language, not mine, but it, it could go for Chinese Americans, um, Latin Americans, Japanese Americans. It, it, it's um, pretty much these concepts are for all people of color, probably even Armenian Americans as well. So uh, I just want to drill in on two questions today uh, out of his, um, he had a pretty long survey. So he conducted a survey, surveyed uh, several hundred people in Pasadena and asked them what their feelings were on issues of race, uh, particularly toward African-Americans. And so this one is uh, one of the most revealing. Would you favor regulations uh, restricting or designating that African-Americans live in a section of the city by themselves? So you can see that it's pretty overwhelmingly yes, uh, with only just a few uh, saying no. So it's ninety percent. Um, so how did the how did these issues when we're talking about um, segregated neighborhoods or segregated schools or schools of choice or schools of default? How did the how did this how does this attitude or behavior factor into all that? Um, so as far as the neighborhoods, what ended, of course, what happened in Pasadena is uh, the issue of redlining and the issue of uh, uh, Realtors Code of Ethics and then uh, covenants and restrictions on where people of color could buy uh, and live, not just buy, but actually live. So the, the dots that you see are um, represent uh, 10 individuals, African-American individuals. And you can see actually the um, the yellow line, the top yellow line, the horizontal one that kind of curves down southward is Orange Grove. And then the middle yellow line in the very middle is Colorado Boulevard. So up above Orange Grove, uh, and then it's west of Fair Oaks is where there's a huge <laughs> concentration. And then down um, near Fair Oaks in Colorado, south of where that's where the 710 freeway is which we talked about in another discussion so um i think you're all familiar with these now i just wanted to revisit this oh one other point is down in the the lower group of dots there was a school named garfield school uh and it's where the vons is on uh right across the street from uh the huntington hospital it's california and pasadena avenue and that was removed. Um, and that was an anchor for that neighborhood of color because there were uh, Latin Americans uh, or Mexican Americans in particular, Japanese Americans and African Americans who all lived in that lower section there. 
And um, when it was removed, it really uh, damaged the, uh, the ability for, well, those kids had to travel further, obviously, to go to school. So um, what was the date of this? What was the date of this paper? Uh, 1941. Thanks for yeah. asking. Um, so he did his research in 1941 and some of the um, actions uh, like taking out Garfield school happened later. Um, and that was the result of the 710 freeway. So that was in the 60s. Uh, this other this is the only other question I wanted to highlight from his uh, uh, thesis paper and his survey is that if it were possible and convenient, would you prefer to have your uh, children attend or you attend or your children attend a school having uh, and then there are options. Many African Americans, only a few, none, uh, it doesn't matter. And again, we can see that it's significant that um, the vast majority of people would prefer to live or to send their kids to a school that is more monochromatic um, and white only. Um, so the, the follow-up question for this and leads us into the discussion about the POSD is what is the status of the POSD today? What percentage of school-aged children uh, do not attend POSD, which is what we were talking about before. So um, a couple Brian, of- Brian, before you go on, could you, who sure. are the people who are being asked? The questions. Oh, uh, yes, great question. So it's um, James Crimey. So he, um, he decided to survey, so these are residents of Pasadena uh, and they are, so, and he took them from a, you can see the groups there. He took them yeah. from a variety of neighborhoods around Pasadena or um, I would say different social groups. And so um, that's how he's categorizing them. Um, but it's mainly their, all white uh and um i would say they're all middle class or above uh, folks so mm -hmm. does that answer your question yes yeah thanks for asking that uh, very helpful so a couple of other um historical aspects is that um garfield school was predominantly kids of color uh and um and also there was a movement in Pasadena to make sure that um, um, Latin American or Mexican American kids uh, were in their own schools. So there were a couple that were built. This is the first one, Unipero Serra School. It lasted for about 20 years. It was, and this one was located down kind of near Huntington Hospital as well on Raymond uh, or Raymond-ish area or Royal Parkway, but it's south of, uh, uh, kind of below that um, section of the city where um, people of color were allowed to live. So um, this particular photograph I've always found is interesting. And this was a, a home ec class, uh, home economics. So the students here are learning how to uh, cook and clean and those sorts of things. So uh, one of the statements that I read in the uh, research I was conducting said the Americanization of students or seen in class learning to cook and organize a kitchen was customary in the US at the time. So this was very common practice. Uh, this is the other school that was built for uh, Mexican American families. And it is, um, Pasadena City College has a community education center, which is out on Foothill Boulevard is kind of near, if you know where the Best Buy is or the um, there was a Bed Bath oh, yeah. Beyond there, uh, Dick's uh, Sporting Goods. So it's about uh, two blocks from there. Um, and that's also because that there was a, um, a Mexican-American, Latino-American community that lived on those streets right above Foothill, maybe even a little bit below Foothill. And the reason why they lived there is because they, uh, in the early uh, 20th century, they were the farmer or they were the the farm hands who picked the uh, onions or the uh, oranges and the, well, maybe onions too, and lemons. So they were working in the orchards at that time. So this school um, was briefly active at that period. So the, the point of um, uh, stating uh, the obvious is that 
uh, schools were built to house specific populations. And part of that was to uh, for segregation or to keep people um, in uh, or to keep families in particular areas and not mix. So um, that uh, Will um, and I think Dick have mentioned a lot of these topics, but what are the impacts of segregation on schools? So, and um, uh, the one that I didn't put up there, uh, which um, Katie mentioned is safety. Um, but but the, the big one is the, the resources. So if, if there are schools in any community or society, so could be Boston, could be Chicago, could be Pasadena, but if they're not um, paid attention to and they're not um, valued, then this is, this is what happens. So overcrowding, understaffed. I think I heard this from several of you about uh, the public schools, older facilities, poor maintenance, fewer resources, and that goes directly to Will's point about funding. And then um, Dick mentioned the less experienced teachers, um, and it goes to administrators as well. Um, but quite often in um, what are known as well, isolated schools or segregated schools, the, the first year or the second year teachers are placed there and the more experienced teachers, certainly in a place like Pasadena, were sent to uh, the white schools. So these are all the impacts. What I think another question I always ask is, so if this is what happens, then, then what are the outcomes for those families? And not only what are the outcomes for those families, but then how do their trajectories impact the rest of society or the rest of um, the community? So if you have people who are less educated or less informed or less capable, then what kind of jobs do they get? Uh, what decisions do they make? Um, where do they live or how do they afford to live? Um, and what are, what are the implications for everything from law enforcement to um, public service programs to housing programs? Um, and how might we, if we shored up or if we improve public education, how might we uh, save money in those other areas? Uh, so getting specific, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some history that it's interesting that Brown versus Board of Education obviously was, uh, and some of you may even remember what happened, but it was a seminal decision by the Supreme Court to deal specifically with segregation. So let's say that there's a white school on one side of town and they get all the resources and the kids are doing really well there. And there's a, um, uh, a school on the other side of town, which is all kids of color. And they, as we said, they don't receive uh, the best teachers, they don't receive um, safety, uh, they don't receive, um, uh, you know, re uh, the materials and supplies, curriculum, whatever it is, and their facilities are falling down. So then what happens is it damages their ability to learn. So the, this is, you know, 70 years ago now, the, the Supreme Court said that that's not fair. That's, that's the whole point of all this. It's not fair, it's not just and in a democratic society, it, it should be dealt with. Uh, so this was the, the way in which uh, the government decided to intercede. So um, this is a, an example, the, this is a photograph of um, uh, Virginia or Norfolk, Virginia. This is the beginning of, uh, and this is what it looked like here in Pasadena in 1970. So, um, the impact reverberated it didn't happen in in pasadena right in 1954 but it wasn't until 1970 so what happened is and and i'll run through this fairly quickly so that we can get to our kind of final uh conversation is um there were a group of families in pasadena they knew about um and i uh, i should have added another bullet point here but they knew about um brown versus board of education they also knew that um, there were eight predominantly schools of color uh, that weren't receiving resources. And then the other 13 schools in the Pasadena Unified School District were that were predominantly white. You can see here that Allendale, 
Elementary in 1969 had 354 white students and only two African-American, while Washington Elementary had 1,060 African-American students and only 28 white students. So the disparity was visible. The, what Judge Manuel Real said is, if we're going to live up to Brown versus Board of Education, we have to figure out, you have to figure out a way to integrate or desegregate schools so that the kids at Washington have the same resources as the kids at Allendale and the kids at Cleveland have the same resources as the kids at, um, say, Noyes School or Hamilton or Willard. So two things happened. One was uh, the, the federal government actually started running Pasadena schools. Uh, so there was a, a federal uh, intervention and that lasted for about uh, six more years or seven years. And then the second one is that uh, the decision was, uh, let's use busing to integrate the schools. So um, one of the resulting outcomes was this whole notion of white flight. And it's kind of what we were talking about before is if you had, if you had any resources at all, you were going to try to get into San Marino, you're trying to get into La Cunada or Arcadia because um, you weren't going to stay. So the statistically 7,000 children left within uh, three to four years, which was about 40% of the white student population. So again, a lot of these facts are, um, uh, we aren't assigning uh, uh, them to be good or evil or good or bad. It's just that this is what happened. So my question is, if this is what happened, then how do we respond to it? So just a couple of other uh, uh, observations. What happened in, in the early 70s, so there was a backlash. So the federal government took over, passed the Unified School District, um, and uh, Judge Manuel Real um, here in the state court system said, you have to uh, integrate, you have to start busing. So there was a backlash. So, and the reason why I bring up this backlash is because it influences what's going on today. So whether Dick called about, talked about magnet schools or Will talked about vouchers, all of this um, was uh, germinated um, at least in Pasadena, by what happened in the early 70s. So there was a, a very, very conservative group of individuals who ran for the school board. At that time, there were five school board members, not the seven that we have now. So three conservative school board members, and they actually found another one, so there were four of them, became the majority on the school board. And these are these. this is the platform that they had uh, so it was anti-busing, so they wanted to dismantle busing. Second one is to oppose federal control of the district, uh, which eventually the feds left anyway. Uh, the next one is book bans. Uh, this is this is a concept that we've heard a lot of, especially the last couple of years, especially since uh, uh, George Floyd's murder. And I bring that up, Dick, because this is the 1619 Project. So there, especially throughout the South, there have been many, many uh, book bans, um, Toni Morrison, um, mm -hmm. uh, Kenji, so uh, everything from white fragility into actually the 1619 Project book itself has been attempted to be banned in a lot of places, Missouri and uh, Mississippi, places like that. So I just gave two examples of a couple of books uh, that uh, were on the list to be banned uh, in 1973 by the school board. The next one is uh, competition over cooperation. So the they felt, these school board members felt that kids needed to learn how to compete. And so they, they diminished any sort of uh, collaborative processes and said, every kid has to be an individual and every kid has to work on their own. So they, uh, they changed or they, they initiated a system of um, competitiveness. Next one was that teachers were censored. They, if they spoke up as school board members, they were uh, disciplined and they, they had a battle. They actually filed a suit against the teachers union um, to keep teachers from speaking. The next one is that students were not allowed to dissent or uh, voice their opinions. Uh, and there was, there was a case of a student who went 
to the school board and complained about a particular book, uh, a William Faulkner book. And they asked her if, did you actually write your speech or did someone write it for you? Because they didn't believe that she had the capacity to be able to write the speech herself. Um, the next one is the uh, three R's, which um, is very important to a fundamentalist or a, um, a traditionalist view of education. And then the last one is the schools of choice, which we were talking about. So they created two fundamental schools. It was at Sierra Mesa, which was the elementary. And then the high school was Marshall Fundamental, which is still, and so this is 1974. Um, Marshall still exists. Sierra Mesa moved to Don Benito and it's kind of morphed into not as much a fundamental school, but uh, Marshall is. So there is a legacy of these activities happening. And the point is back to the schools of choice is if, if the a district becomes all schools of choice, then uh, what does that do for neighborhood schools? And if there are no neighborhood schools and what is the impact on the community and on families? Um, and then also what is the landscape for competition? So is Don Benito competing against Hamilton for kids? Is Muir competing against PHS for kids? Is Marshall competing against all the other ones for kids? And if that's the case, and are they all competing against Maranatha and LaSalle and mm -hmm. Westridge and Pasti Nepali? And if that's the case, then what does the system look like and what are the choices for parents? I'm sorry that um, uh, Katie had to leave, but um, uh, she's immersed in all this right now too. So I'd be happy to talk to her later. So um, just to um, answer some of the questions we raised earlier, the approximate number of school-aged children in the POSD area, Pasadena Altina, Sierra Madre is uh, in the 25 to 30,000 ballpark. I don't have an exact number. No one can get me an exact number, which is infuriating, but um, I'm gonna keep looking. So I'm guessing it's around 28,000. Um, the approximate percentage of kid, of families or kids attending POSD schools is right around 50%. So one thing that I always, or that we asked earlier, what is, what is the impact on society if half or less than half of our, our students, our young people are educated um, in public school? Or what it, to turn that around, what if um, the independent schools are... Um, educated more kids. And so what does that do for everything from consistency to, you know, the civic engagement that many of you mentioned earlier um, and the competitive nature out there, there, and this, this is fairly, I've um, qualified that or counted this uh, several times, but it's about 55 non-public or independent schools. So that's the Catholic schools you were talking about. There's a Muslim school in town. There's a Jewish school in town. There are, um, there's Sequoia School, there's um, Walden School, there's Waldorf School, there's Astoria School. I mean, there's, you know, everything you can think of. Um, just in this community, there's approximately 55. And so there are about 23 public schools and 55 non-public. And to that question about cost, and I'm going to wrap up now, to that question about cost is... Um, average so like some of them on the high end like Pasadena Poly and Westridge are around the 40,000 area and then some are lower so to Will's point yes there are some that are more affordable so the the Catholic schools are much less cost wise although they're having to raise their their prices too to keep up or to continue to provide uh, the services they want to provide but the average and this was U.S. News and World Reports is $19,800 so just think if you're a, a family that's making, and that's for one kid, if you're a family that's making $30 an hour, dad is making $30 an hour, which that seems like a decent income, right? What does that translate into? That's 60,000 a year, which seems like a decent income. There's no way you're gonna be able to spend 20, almost $20,000 on a, a private school education if you're at, at $30 an hour, which is good. Let's say you're even at fifty dollars an hour, which means you're making a hundred thousand a year. That's still um, twenty percent of your your income uh, would be going to private school. So uh, just keep those stats in mind. So this is what I want to wrap up with. Um, why is public ed education important? Maybe it isn't to you, um, but maybe it is. Um, what what could your role be? if it is in ensuring that POSD schools have the resources they need to be successful. 
And then what role would the village play in supporting public schools? And so I'm gonna pull that off now. And then just some last thoughts. Um, do you think public education is a value? If so, what could you do to help support it? What could the village do? Any, any thoughts before we go? Does anybody think public education is important or should we all just go private? Betsy, we'll go Betsy and then Dick. What I'm thinking about is the, uh, I come from New England and uh, in New Hampshire, especially they have town meetings and uh, everybody goes to the same schools and the towns are small. And so it's pretty much the model that we started out with in this country in colonial America. And uh, it's so different from now. And it does tie in with our civic education and uh, the whole knowledge of what the whole community is about and what all the concerns are for the community. And there's obviously uh, with this uh, fracturing of our society, you don't have that. You don't have that common knowledge and experience and actual voting around uh, issues that confront that community, be it, you know, fresh water or whatever that issue might be. Thank you very much, Betsy, for those observations. Dick, you're next. Well, I think, I think public education is a foundation of the society, and I think it's very important if we lose quality public education we're living in a different world and it goes it's it goes down to the idea of shared knowledge and shared experience of the world and we we have to have things in common so that we see everyone in the society as someone who's part of the society and equally deserving of the resources of the society and public education it, when it's done properly contributes to that i think it's a very important element of our society Okay, great. Um, Will, Sharon, Tony, any any other thoughts uh, before we go? And then also, um, how might you help, Will? Well, it's, I think public education is one of the great institutions for our society. I think right now, I was shocked at how few people were going to public schools in Pasadena. So we're already at a critical point there. It has to be the right kind of education, which respects the people's ability to think for themselves and have training in how to think for themselves. And that's a big, big push. But yes, we need to do it. Yeah, critical thinking is a skill everyone needs to learn. Thank you, Will. Sharon or Tony? Yeah, let's go um, to Tony. I spent 43 years as a public education educator starting as a classroom aide, ending as a director of operations for the second largest school district. I spent my life believing in public education. And um, I, I agree that it provides a shared set of experiences from which we can come together and have some shared thinking about what we need as a Thank you, Sharon. Tony? Uh, what I was going to say is I live in La Cañada, and we got here at the time when there was enormous busing of the children. And I, we had little children, and we were concerned about having them bust all over. So, And my husband worked at the Je at Jet Propulsion Lab. So we moved to La Cañada. Uh, I didn't realize how white it was when we first moved. Um, when I, after we bought the house and I talked to the real estate agent, she said, oh, you blacks are not allowed to, to come in. And I thought, oh God, because I wasn't happy about that because I grew up in Washington, DC, where there was a, a great divide between rich and poor. So here we were in La Cañada. Now, one of the things about La Cañada is it does have a unified school district and most of the people, I, I, think, I think most of the people go to the public schools. So it's it's a bit different than than what's happened in um, in Pasadena. But as I learn more about the history, I see how, why La Cañada came over and made its own unified school district. I didn't know anything about that at the time. So it's just to come in. I think public schools are enormously important. And 
from my perspective, because I went to private schools, I lived in Washington, D.C., you don't know the rest of the world. You just know those white people. <laughs> That's not, it's not the way that we can build society. It's, it's a very bad idea to have this uh, exclusionary thing. <laughs> Great. Um, Betsy? I can give you a little report from my lifetime, which is that I grew up, went to public school, told you about my experience in New England. Uh, then uh, I taught in public school for five years in Acton, Massachusetts, went to New York City when I was first married, taught in private school, uh, came to Pasadena, taught at Polytechnic School. Um, I bought a house in Pasadena in 1975, benefited tremendously from the reduction in price of housing in, in that window of time. Um, then I uh, have now, my daughter went all through Poly. And um, the other grandparent, um, Mary Favre, also taught at Poly and Westridge, and then she became a, 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 an educator and a principal of schools. Um, then my grandchildren, we may, my, we, my daughter uh, had her children in my granddaughter in a public school up in Fremont when they moved to Pasadena. Uh, we, tried the public school because she arrived in October. So she went to the public school for two years. She went um, to Hamilton School. Uh, she was in the third grade and then the fourth grade, but the fourth grade year was a COVID year. And she was basically at home doing Zoom with uh, a nanny to cover her and uh, uh, situation. So, um, and then the next year we moved on to private school and now they are at, my grandchildren are at Westridge and Chandler. So that gives you the history. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, so just to wrap up uh, one part is, um, thank you all for your participation and for your uh, sharing your lives. So just to um, leave you with what if if public education is um, a value that our society holds uh, that is important, then again, what and and I want to thank Sharon for her career dedicated to public school. But what what might the village do to be able to ensure that um, whether it's Muir High School or Madison or Washington or any of the others um, had uh, just a little bit of extra support. Um, and I'm not talking about financial, but what um, knowledge, wisdom, experience could the village uh, contribute to the Pasadena Unified School District? So just no, no need to answer that right now, but just be thinking about it as you move forward. Uh, Sharon has a, has a thought. I have a thought. Um, I live two blocks from the camp and I've lived here 22 years. And when I first moved here, Kenleywood School District office, and then it was converted back to a school. In that amount of time, the school has never reached out to the community at all for anything. Um, we never get a flyer for anything. We never, nothing. It's like the school is just down there. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a phone call and I'm going to say I live in the community and I'd like to be a member of the PTA. Is that possible? That'd be great. And I'll go down uh, with my checkbook and give them their twenty dollars or whatever it costs to join the PTA, and um, see if I can get you know share in a meeting or something. That's fantastic, and that's so easy. And it's easy. Yeah, it'll make it. Down. It'll make a difference. Uh, one of my friends, just a fun closing story. He said, "I wanted to help, but I didn't know what to do, so I joined all the PTAs at all the schools." <laughs> And so now he's on all the email lists, so he's able to, okay. to figure it out. And Sharon, just, I, I missed it. What school do you live near? McKinley. Oh, McKinley, great. Yeah, right, they'll, great. Well, they'll love it. 
Well, thank you very much, Brian. And I see we had no trouble filling the 90 minutes and I think we could go longer, but uh, we are out of time. So thank you very much for another great presentation. This will be up on the web as soon as we can get it there. And we will use our summary notes here from this to perhaps produce uh, a nice summary of this very complex conversation. I don't, I don't know how well our robot is gonna do it uh, summarizing this one. <laughs> I'll be interested to see it, Dick. Yeah. To read the summary. Uh oh, he froze. Yes. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> Dick, you're frozen. Have a good day. Have a good day, Bye, Brian. Bye. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. <laughs>